Trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue, clouds of white, the bright blessed day, the dark sacred night. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. The colors of the rainbow so pretty in the sky and also on the faces of people passing by. I see friends shaking hands saying, how do you do? And they're really saying, I love you. I hear babies cry, I watch them grow. They'll learn much more than I'll ever know. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Yes, I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Louis Daniel Armstrong, Satchmill. We have any guests here? Well, I'll sing it next time. Yeah. Bill, I will, but you don't want that. Believe me. So we have any guests today? Please. Hey. I'd like to introduce Françoise Poissard. She is the wife of Jean-Louis Poissard, who is the French delegate to the France America Interconference Conference for Peace that we're having right now at the FedEx Center. But I missed her when the lunch, so I wouldn't miss my morning meeting. Well, Any more guests? My guest is Karina Stover here for her fourth visit. All right, welcome. <laughs> so glad to have you. Visiting Rotarians, said they find us. So uh, I don't know where the find basket is. Got it, Terry. So, if you don't have your pen or badge on, or if sometime during the week, if sometime during the week, at home or work or wherever, if you fail the four-way test, you got to put in two dollars. <laughs> got the basket? Okay. Uh, I'm your sergeant at arms, as I said. Now, sergeant... That's a term that you usually associate with the military. But, but not always. I mean, there are some things that East Chapel Hill Rotary Club uh, has in common with the military or the, uh, or the Army. So in the military, sergeants, they don't usually establish policy. In the military, sergeants usually implement policy in front of the troops. Uh, I'm a sergeant, I'm in front of the troops, and so I implement policy. This week, sergeants usually uh, get instructions, get policy from their captains and the colonels. Well, as sergeant in arms, I have a captain. I heard from my captain this week. Captain Steve from me. <laughs> so he sent me a communique, that's military for email. <laughs> he had heard from our colonel. Raise your hand, Colonel Mike. No, 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 no. You're the colonel and he's the captain. So the sergeants usually do what the captains and the colonels. I only tell them to do most of the time. <laughs> if they're going to go off track, they usually ask for permission. Usually. 
But what you learn in the military that it's much easier to get forgiveness than it is to get permission. So what am I about to do? I don't have permission to do. But in the end, I'm going to ask for your permission. Now, my communique said that I was to either recite the four-way test or have you stand up and recite the four-way test. But we're not going to do that today. <laughs> clap, clap, clap. Instead, I'm going to tell you where the four-way test came from. In 1932, a guy, a gentleman by the name of Herbert J. Taylor, who was a prominent businessman in Chicago, was asked to take over a near bankrupt company called Club Aluminum Company. Mm. They were half a million dollars in debt. They distributed cookware and other household items. So he reluctantly took on the assignment to try to save the company. And what he found out early on is that there was a toxic environment within the company. And in terms of their relationship with their customers and their relationship with their uh, competitors as well. In fact, he found as things were coming across his desk, marketing kinds of things, he saw that they weren't true. Actually were not true. And that bothered him. So in his effort to change the culture of the company, he developed two legal pad pages full of to do's and to don't do's. And he thought about it and said, no, that doesn't work. What I need to do is give my employees sort of a line, sort of a, a, a method, a how of making decisions and how to interact with their colleagues within the department and their customers and their competitors. Competitors. So he write, he woke up one morning, sat down at his kitchen table, and he wrote the four-way test. It's the exact same four-way test that we recite. That was in 1932. In 1942, he was a director of Rotary International. And one of his colleagues encouraged him to pass on the four-way test that he had adopted to Rotary International, and in 1942, they adopted the four-way uh, four test. He, uh, this guy, Herbert Taylor, later became president of Rotary. Isn't that fascinating? Do you want to know, I'm sure, how do I know all this? I mean, was it just, you know, osmosis? No, I went to Jody. I said, Jody, where do I go in the universe to find the, the ultimate information? And she said, you got to go to Mount Sinai. <laughs> All of this is born there. And then you got to go to the top and you got to spend 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> and you'll come down with these tablets and they'll all be in gray. And you'll know. I decided I would Google instead. <laughs> you know, that's exactly what I tell my students. <laughs> so I, I Googled on Wednesday and this is what I found. Captain, can I, can I call on you? Yeah. How do you know all that but not know the four-way test? Well, I haven't been in Rotary long enough. <laughs> or I've been in Rotary too long. There's a, there's a point in which, you know, it goes down this way. She returns. Okay. Did I, here's, here's where I need your help. Did I pass the four-way test today, and do I now have your forgiveness to do what I did? Yes. Yeah. 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 I'm glad he didn't say Colonel Clean. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Good to see everybody here again today. Uh, looks like we're going to have a little rain leaving today. Uh, a couple housekeeping things. Please remember to take your trash from your lunches today, put them in a trash can so we can dispose of them properly. Also, 
when you come to park here, we have several parking areas to park in. Don't create a parking space. Park in one of the designated areas. Last week, somebody decided to get creative and park up at the ballet studio on the grass and the, some of the pavement. And that's a no-no. Please don't do that again. We like it here. We like to stay here. Uh, and uh, that's about all I've said. Ed Loudermilk has got a couple things he wants to talk about. So come on up, Mr. Ed. Or, It is, it is the first Saturday in December. Thanks, Ed, for running this project board. For you new members, this yes, ma'am. For you new members, this is a great way to get involved. He said two volunteers, seven, eight of you volunteer. Okay, y'all just see Ed. Uh, it's a, it's fun. We've been the, uh, this project started. Dick Badur and them started this getting bikes out of the junkyard rebuild. 1978. 1978. So if you want to want to be a part of this club's tradition, history, and doing good deeds, this is a darn good way to do it. Okay. Um, Linda. Yeah, just a, a quick update. Um, at the SEC Family Pass last night, a great turnout. Uh, Joe Jenkins was able to make it today. We had our first interactor, a ninth grader, who came and joined us, and she had a marvelous time. So, for those of you who have a chance to join the next SEC Family House, please join, sign up. It was just a wonderful <laughs> also, those books that you saw in the day that everybody picked up a copy of were bought by uh, club member Robert Owen. So let's give Robert a big hand for that. So please come up. We do have a couple more books. Unless that's yours, Tim. No, nope. two more books left. Does anybody, anybody want a book? Tim, Tim can bring it to you. Got, got two back right there. That's all two more questions. What a nice gift. I am going to give a very brief bio so we can, uh, so we can for intro so we can hear more of Dean. Dean and I are actually both natives of Richmond, Virginia, and we had the wisdom and insight at a young age to travel down 85 to attend uh, our undergraduate uh, days here in Chapel Hill. Uh, a couple of highlights of Dean's from his time at UNC, and there's a lot more detail in the bios as, as, as is usual, uh, so please take a look at that. He met his first wife, Jessica, 
My wife, my wife hates only. that joke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 His wife Jessica, during his uh, sophomore year here, and she sometimes serves as his first editor. And he was on UNC's men's lacrosse team's second national championship in 1982. I guess that was Coach Sprouts. That was, yep. Um, and one interesting fact that Dean never really talks about is that he is an amateur pig farmer. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's <laughs> like to thank Robert for making the books available to everybody and, and also for pleasing his wife who wanted this meeting to happen so she could get the books out of the house. So uh, she'll be very happy that you took them all and I'll be happy to sign them afterwards. Uh, so this book was uh, 25 years in the making. Uh, in 1998 I went with uh, my, my mother-in-law, uh, got a cabin in Yosemite Valley for my father-in-law's 70th birthday and I went there to this view, if you've been to Yosemite, how many people here have been to Yosemite? A lot of people, right? So you've probably been to this view. If you've been, you've probably been to this, and they call it the tunnel view now. But um, in, in the olden days, it was Inspiration Point. And if you, go to, if, you, if you go there now and you go to the tunnel view, you drive your car through there, and there's a big parking lot and a lot of people. But if you, if you hike on the trail out of the back, you go up about a mile, you'll, you'll be at Inspiration Point, and there's nobody there. You, you can sit there and take in this view by yourself. So they talk about overcrowding it, and 3.5 million people went to the Yosemite National Park last year, so it is overcrowded. But if you get off the beaten path, you can still do some pretty cool things. Uh, it, the view did what it was uh, said to do. It inspired me. I knew that, you know, as an East Coast kid, used to the Appalachians, and I've been to Europe more than I've been to the West, uh, it really opened my eyes. It was a different scale, uh, different landscape of America. I knew I wanted to spend time with it and try to figure it out. This led me to John Muir, uh, who was really the, the, the embodiment of this place, and really led me to a story that I, I couldn't have imagined originally, um, uh, just based on the landscape. And the essence of the book really is that I think this is the story of the greatest writer editor relationship in American literature. Uh, the, these two guys, John Muir, and at one point I, I, I said, let's call this book Robert Underwood Johnson and, well, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Muir. And they're like, you can't call it Mr. Johnson. Nobody knows who Mr. Johnson is. But he was an amazing man of letters. And the two together, uh, they created Yosemite National Park. They uh, put together the, the group that would uh, create our national forest. They started the Sierra Club and they started the modern environmental movement, the modern grassroots environmental movement. So uh, John Muir was originally from Dunbar, Scotland, born in uh, 1838, uh, migrated to the, the U.S. Uh, year of the gold rush, 1849. Uh, Dunbar is still very proud of him. Here's the old high street. Yeah, that monument is still there of John Muir, and there's now a new John Muir National Way. I'm gonna skip through his early years uh, pretty quickly. This is not a biography. This is a, a, the narrative, the story of these two guys and what they accomplished together. But this, this is irresistible. Imagine uh, your college roommate didn't have a desk, couldn't afford to buy a desk, so he invented one and whittled it out of wood. And that's his desk at the University of Wisconsin. And, I read about his inventions. Uh, his father was evangelical Christian and worked him really hard in the fields from dawn to dusk at, at the farm in Wisconsin. So Muir invented uh, a bed that uh, used clockwork and it was, it was set to a timer. It would pull the legs out from uh, under the, the foot of his bed and dump them in a pan of cold water at 1 a.m. so he could get up and read. And, uh, and you know, you read about that. I'm like, yeah, I don't, yeah okay. I, I'm not sure I can really picture that. But this desk still exists. You can go to the library at the University of Wisconsin, and it is finely whittled, and it's a beautiful thing. Uh, it rotated every 15 minutes so that he could keep on his study schedule. Uh, he was a bit of a... a a bit of a freak, frankly, at the university, and his room was a museum and, and freak show, and everybody came through the, the, the room to see his inventions and all the weird stuff he brought in out of the woods. He spoke with uh, the, the Scottish brogue, and, and, but used sort of concrete farm language, and so he, he was really quite an extraordinary guy. Uh, 
So here we are. I'm going to take you now right to uh, his first view looking into Yosemite Valley. Um, he had wandered into it the year before during winter, but uh, it, he, he also decided when he saw it that he wanted to be there. He wanted to live in this place and study it. And, uh, and so he became a shepherd. And they were up in the uh, high Sierras and came down and looked over uh, you know, the mile end of view down uh, Yosemite Falls. And uh, I'll read you a passage from the book about this. Uh, Wishing to be a part of this God work as nearly as possible, Muir took off his shoes and stockings and pressing his feet and hands against the slick granite, worked his way down until his head was near the booming, rushing, energizing stream. Noticing that it leveled before its dive, he hoped it could lean out over the edge and see down into the falling water and through it to the bottom. But when he reached the edge, he discovered it to be false. Another steeper ledge lay below. It appeared too steep to allow him to reach the brink. However, he could not convince himself to abandon the effort. He could see the cliff fully now and spied a narrow rim, just wide enough to hold his heels. Studying the polished surface of river wall, he noticed a seam, a fault line that might provide the needed finger holes to reach the cliff's edge. His nerves tingled as he considered his next move. The reverberation of the water enveloped him and he began to feel a part of it, a giddy mix of emotions, elation, wonder, fear, swam in his head. He decided again not to move forward, but then he did. The slope was not his enemy. He was a part of it. He crept forward, and when he reached the small ledge about three inches wide, planted his heels on it. Then he shuffled sideways like a crab toward the precipice. 30 feet to go, 20 feet. The water beside him now white and agitated as it sped to its threshold, 10 feet. At last, the edge was right in front of him. Legs firm, body stiff, arching, he peered over. His eyes bored into the billowing freefall, and he watched the spill separate into streamers, comets of water whose tails refracted the sunlight. As the creek flowed past him on its grand adventure, his body and soul seemed to hang there, somewhere in between terra firma and air infinitum. Another current, Emerson's words, he well knew. In the woods, we return to reason and faith. There I feel nothing can befall me in life. No disgrace, no calamity, which nature cannot repair. Muir lost any sense of the passage of time and later could not remember his retreat from the ledge. Wow. Although a slip of the heel could have sent him over with a powerful creek, the magnificence of the fall, its ever active and changing form, its rumble and sudden silence, its action and refraction, its immediacy and its distance held him spellbound. So many stimuli bombarded his senses that there was no room for fear. Instead, where earth and water met air and light, Muir, with the religious fervor of his upbringing, saw God. He saw God in the fragmentation of the stream and in the rays of the sun passing through to make vivid rainbow beads. He saw God in the rebirth of the stream, suddenly expelled from earth, as death and a new life, a new journey, were simultaneously manifest. So that's his first view uh, over the, the uh, into the valley. And when I when I read his experience there, looking through the, the beads, and he had no fear gene. He would he he climbed amazingly up and down mountains and exploring this whole area. Um, I was very moved by it by his um, translation of a pretty brutal childhood. He learned, he had memorized the New Testament. It was whipped into him by his father and most of the Old Testament as well. Um, so he had a pretty tough religious experience, but he sort of metabolized all that through nature and, and kept his faith in devoutness uh, and, and, and brought it to, to Yosemite Valley uh, and, and wrote about it for us to enjoy. And learn from it. So here I am. That's the view down. You can see how steep it is. Fortunately, there's a guardrail there because I don't lack the fear gene. Um, and this is the stream coming to the edge and plunging over. So he decided he would stay in the Yosemite Valley, and this is 1869. Abraham Lincoln had made it a state park during the war, given it to California to preserve and protect. Uh, it was still a pretty remote place, though there were some people there who had set up some lodging houses for tourists in the summer. Muir stayed in the winter uh, and explored it and determined that glaciers had formed the valley. At the time, the leading scientist 
from Harvard thought that a cataclysm had caused the bottom to fall out of uh, out of the valley. And Muir saw the scrapings of the glaciers and and said, no, that's not the case. It was glaciers that formed this valley and all the Sierra Nevada, in fact. And um, and the, the leading scientists called him a, a knucklehead and and stupid, but he was actually correct. So um, he wrote about that. His voice um, writing about uh, Yosemite Valley was he was published in Scribner magazine, and then which became Century magazine. And he he really became one of our leading uh, uh, voices of nature. Um, Emerson visited him in 1871, and sort of there was kind of a passing of the torch from Thoreau and Emerson to this moment where, where Emerson comes to the valley, and there's a chapter in the book about it, so I won't go into it too much, but um, Emerson was getting old, he was past his prime, and, and Muir was trying to get him to go out and camp with him, and, and Emerson's um, entourage wouldn't let him do it. And so it was this kind of disappointing and painful meeting. At the end, when Emerson left, um, Muir for the first time felt lonely in the wilderness. Muir would go out and spend a week with a loaf of bread and some meat juice and some coffee and climb the mountains. He was amazing what he could live off and what he could do. But uh, it, uh, Emerson was like, you need to come to Harvard. And you know, I'm, I've got a place where you're gonna come out here and lecture. And Muir was torn by that because he admired Emerson so much. But he also knew that the reason why Emerson admired him was because he was doing what Emerson truly believed in. He was living at one with nature and finding his spiritual fulfillment there. Uh, <clears throat> Good things don't last forever. Muir had to leave the valley. He married uh, the daughter of a fruit farmer in Martinez, California, and ran a fruit ranch for uh, almost a decade. At, at the time, uh, he, he was an excellent fruit farmer, um, and they became wealthy. It was a, 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 you can still visit it today in Martinez, the mansion that uh, his father-in-law built that he and his wife, uh, Louis Strenzel, would, would later occupy. But, <clears throat> He stopped writing about the mountains, and he was becoming physically uh, unhealthy. And his, even though his wife um, didn't like the, the outdoors, and here Muir made her go to Yosemite with him one time, she didn't like to hike, so here he is pushing her with a stick, his walking stick, up the mountain. He drew this a letter to, yeah, Muir was a great family man, they had two daughters. He drew this in a, a letter that he wrote to his three-year-old daughter, um, you know, to, to show her what was going on there. And, um, and uh, so, but, but she, she was, uh, she loved the fruit farm. She was a pianist, real homebody, but she knew Muir and she loved Muir and she was his soulmate. She was also his first editor. And um, she said, John, you need to leave the fruit ranch. You need to get out of here because you're wasting away and your best work is, is your nature writing. And so um, she pushed him out of the next nest and uh, here he is uh, atop Mount Rainier in the seventh known ascent of Rainier. Pretty dangerous climb, particularly in the gear at that time. Uh, there's a pretty harrowing account of that uh, in the book you know, as they're sliding down the, the ice of this mountain with the nail, they have nails in their boots trying to hang on to the, to the thing. But he got back to nature at this moment and, and returned and, and, and then <clears throat> it would lead to great things. So this is Robert Underwood Johnson here on the left. That's Muir uh, in his uh, younger glory days. And he was a very handsome guy and um, uh, kind of a, a glamorous outdoorsman in his own way. Johnson, there aren't many pictures of Johnson. So Johnson was really 15 years Muir's junior, but here he's a little bit older. And he was also an extraordinary guy. He grew up in Centerville, Indiana. And he, um, uh, during the Civil War at the age of 11, he told his parents, hey, I'm gonna go work at the train station. And they were like, what? You know, you're 11 years old, what are you, what are you talking about? He said, yeah, the, the, the station master wants me to come work there. So he goes there and learns to do the, uh, the telegraph. Uh, and there's a guy down the line who's really fast at the telegraph and the other older guys can't pick up his messages, but Muir, an 11 year old can. The other guy's Thomas Edison who was uh, a teenager too. And, and so it's, it's Johnson and, and Thomas Edison talking to each other during the Civil War. Uh, Johnson's taking down messages, sad messages sometimes to families that their son has died in the war. He gets on a horse and rides out and tells the family. And when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, it was Johnson who was at the telegraph, took down the message and went out on the platform and announced it uh, to the people there. So, um, so, so kind of like Muir, he was, well, you know, that was the wrong place at the right time, I guess, but uh, they were in the thick of things always. Johnson then moved to Chicago 
and was there during the Great Fire and left a great account of that. He was discovered there, moved to New York, and became uh, an editor uh, of Century Magazine. And Century Magazine uh, did a series, a three-year series on the Civil War, where they interviewed the leaders on both sides of all the major battles. It doubled their circulation from 125,000 to 250,000. It made Johnson a really prominent uh, voice in Century Magazine, one of the uh, you know conversation places for American culture and, and thinking, and that and that history that they put together is still um, uh, used today as, as one of our sort of uh, central Civil War kind of bedrock uh, accounts. Uh, so uh, to follow that up, uh, they sent Johnson uh, to California to report on the gold rush, and uh, and so when he got there, he had been editing Muir for for a number of years, and uh, Muir said, "Listen." You've been listening to me for a long time. You got to come to Yosemite. And Johnson was kind of a, a bit of a city slicker, but he went to, to Yosemite with Muir, and uh, Muir took him around, and uh, and it, it was kind of a seminal moment in in environmental history. Uh, and I'm just going to read a, a passage after they've been hiking around and go up to they see the the uh, what's been happening to the valley, how beautiful it is, but also how under the state. Um, uh, maintenance, it is, it is kind of crumbling. Uh, and so uh, by the campfire at Soda Springs, Muir and Johnson began a conversation that would profoundly impact the way America preserved its most precious landscapes. Whereas Muir was a philosopher and a man of action in the outdoors, he felt hopeless at swaying policymakers. Johnson, on the other hand, was an activist, shaping the nation's conversation whether at his New York City dinner table with the likes of Twain, Burroughs, Kipling, and Tesla in the pages of Century Magazine or in the halls of Congress. Having heard Muir and having now experienced for himself the simultaneous beauty and degradation of Yosemite, he felt an urge to do something about it, and he thought the two of them could make a powerful case for stronger protections. Now all he had to do was overcome Muir's skepticism that politicians would have the foresight and courage to protect the environment. So Johnson tells Muir, look, you write me two articles, I'm gonna publish them in Century Magazine, I'm gonna take them down to Washington, D.C., put them on every congressman's desk, and we're gonna get a bill passed and create Yosemite National Park. Muir had tried his hand a little bit at activism and had, had, uh, it hadn't worked out very well, but uh, he gave it one more shot, he, he trusted Johnson, wrote the articles, Johnson published them, went down to D.C., and they created Yosemite National Park. So it was, it was uh, uh, an incredible moment uh, when, when I read about that, um, to be honest, you know, I came into this uh, after just seeing Yosemite Valley. I didn't know Muir. I hadn't read Muir. And, but when I got to this moment as a writer, when I saw what this writer and this editor had done concretely, they'd taken this beautiful writing and thinking that, that, uh, of Muir and turned it into concrete action, I was blown away. And I knew that was what this book needed to be about. There's a you know, great Pulitzer Prize winning biography from the 40s about Muir, but it's sprawling and you read it and I, and, and, I, and I was like, well, he was the second or third best of a lot of different things. You know, he's an explorer, he's this great fruit farmer, he did a lot in Alaska, but what's the central narrative? Why do we need to know Muir? What's important? And it's really that arc that I try to capture here of Muir and Johnson uh, translating Muir's really nature philosophy uh, onto the page and then taking it down to DC and, and getting uh, uh, this really concrete action. Uh, so after, after this, after they got Yosemite National Park passed, which really was just the beginning of their problems because Lincoln had created a state park, which was the valley. And the national park at that time was then a donut around the state park. And you can imagine state officials and federal officials uh, weren't happy with each other and could not get their plans to, to match up. So it took them another 20 years to get uh, the state to recede the, uh, the valley to the federal government to create the national park as we know it today. But Johnson was giddy about it and he said, let's do something else. Uh, let's save Kings Canyon, which you know now is a national park as well. So Muir, Muir who's been down there, he's, he's researched all the Sierra Nevada and, and Johnson knows about Kings Canyon because of Muir. He goes down there and sees that they're cutting down all these giant sequoias. And this is the, the Mark Twain tree. Uh, and I want to read just a very quick passage. Uh, one of my first talks was for the Mark Twain house in Hartford, Connecticut. It was virtual. Uh, and the moderator said, 
Uh, could you please read this passage? I've read it three times. It makes me cry every time. Um, as the general noble tree fell in the Converse Basin Grove in 1892, a year after Twain's namesake met its demise, this is Twain's tree. This is the general noble tree. Uh, the giant sequoia lurched back against its stump in its death throes, as if admonishing the jubilant lumberjacks who had just severed the last fibers of what is believed to be the largest tree ever cut down. The massive 3,000 year old sequoia, named after the sitting Secretary of the Interior, both until that moment still very much alive, sent the men leaping as it smashed scaffolds and rigging. They fell onto the wildly vibrating stump some 95 feet in circumference, the Chicago stump as it would become known, and found themselves balancing on wobbly knees in the midst of their own self-induced earthquake. They would make a 30 foot tall cross section of the tree, cleanly cut at both ends, hollow it out, and then prepare it for transportation to Chicago, where during the upcoming World's Columbian Exposition, it would be erected in the White City, in the rotunda of the government building, ringed by benches and outfitted with a spiral staircase. Rather a tawdry ending for such a, a grand tree of several centuries old. And many people who saw the, the, it at the exhibi uh, exhibition uh, still thought it was a hoax. The reason they, nobody believed that these trees could be this big. And so um, it, it didn't even work. Uh, but so Muir was the first guy crying out in the wilderness, basically, stop this madness. They were just um, uh, mauling the trees. These giant sequoias weren't even good for building because the wood's too brittle. They used the, the wood for um, roof shingles and fence stakes. But once you set up you know, a, a timber mill and you've got a crew out there, you don't want it to stop. You know, every minute's money. So they're just mowing down everything they can with no regard to, to trees. But it was also the institutions. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Natural History Museum in New York City has a big uh, cross section of one of the trees, and the Twain tree, in fact. Uh, and so um, the, these two guys uh, then got involved in creating the commission, uh, the National Forest Commission, that would then recommend that uh, 21 million acres of forest land be preserved. And, uh, and that created our natural forest system. And there, uh, Muir at that point was asked because that was a controversial thing at the time. And um, the Western states didn't want it to happen. They didn't want this land preserved because they were busy chopping it down and, and selling it. And so um, Muir was asked to sell it to the American public to get Congress to pass it. And he basically wrote uh, a creation story uh, which he called the, the American Forest, and it ran in Atlantic Magazine. In the American Forest, Muir hearkened back to his religious roots with a poetic creation myth for the nation's woodlands. The forests of America, however slighted by man, must have been a great delight to God, for they were the best he ever planted, he began. The whole continent was a garden, and from the beginning it seemed to be favored above all the other wild parks and gardens of the globe. These forests were composed of about 500 species of trees, all of them in some way useful to man, and some were lordly monarchs proclaiming the gospel of beauty like apostles. To Mira's eyes, they were fully alive. Nature fed them, dressed them, loaded them with flowers and fruit. The wind rustled their leaves, exercised their fibers, and pruned them. He described their beauty in all seasons, and then rang the alarm. Even the fires of the Indians and the fierce shattering lightning seemed to work together only for good in clearing spots here and there for smooth garden prairies and openings for sunflowers seeking the light. But when the steel ax of the white man rang out in the startled air, their doom was sealed. The bread and money seekers denuded the Atlantic coast and devastated the Mississippi River Valley and the vast Great Lakes Pine region. Finally, an invading horde of destroyers called settlers crossed the Rockies to fell and burn more fiercely than ever, at last reaching the wild side of the continent in the great aboriginal forests of the Pacific coast. Clearing has surely now gone far enough, he argued. The remnant protected will yield plenty of timber, a perennial harvest for every right use, without further diminution of its area, and will continue to cover the springs of the rivers that rise in the mountains and give irrigating waters to the dry valleys at their feet. That's an important passage, I think, because here our greatest environmentalist is arguing to preserve this land for industrial use, 
He was also Muir had the mind of an engineer. He worked in factories as a youth. He had to drop out of the University of Wisconsin. He didn't have money. His father wouldn't give him any money. He worked in a factory. He'd go in the factory, and, and after a couple of weeks, he'd say, you need to change everything around, and pretty soon it would be you know, working at 200% capacity of what it was. But he understood that, that handles for brooms and handles for shovels were for the good of humanity. It made life easy. It made life better in ways. So he wasn't as pure as I think in this kind of polarized political era. Here's our chief um, arguer for preserving nature is also saying, hey, we need to preserve a certain section that, that, and, and manage it properly. It'll provide all the things we need, all these physical things we also need from the woods. Johnson also told him, look, I could start up a group out here in New York and we could raise money and we could defend the wilderness out in California, but you don't want us to do that. You Californians don't want that. You need to do your own thing. And, and Muir said, hey, I, I'm the nature guy, I'm the poet and the philosopher, I don't do meetings, and I don't, you know, I'm not, that's not me. Johnson didn't uh, often take no for an answer, so he got some professors at Berkeley and some uh, professionals in San Francisco, he said, hey, have a meeting, start this organization, invite Muir, elect him president. That's what they did. So that's how Muir became the president of the Sierra Club which he uh, adapted to and loved and, and remained the president of the Sierra Club for the rest of his life. Uh, and and he, um, he, he believed in getting people out. The Sierra Club was formed not to save forests. It was formed to bring people to the forest. And that all goes back to that beginning when he's looking over, seeing God in the, in the water, the, the death of the stream, the rebirth of it going down to the valley to create new life. And, and um, because he, he believed that's where you found spiritual meaning in nature. He believed that Yosemite and, and nature's beauty was uh, the, the manifestation of God on earth. And so he wanted to bring people to, uh, you know, to, the, to nature. You, know, you also need to protect it. And he knew that if you brought people to nature, they would fall in love with it and, um, and defend it. So um, uh, that's what he did. The, the Sierra Club would go on to fight the battle to save Hetch Hetchy. And about the last third of the book is about this battle to save uh, this valley right here, which San Francisco wanted uh, to dam up, have a reservoir, and also get electrical power because it's up pretty high. Uh, Muir fought it, Sierra Club fought it, several presidents, several secretaries of the interior um, also were on his side. No, you know, don't take part of the national park. You can get the water somewhere else. Uh, then there was the great earthquake and fire in San Francisco in 1906. San Francisco suddenly had political capital there was a big battle in Congress, really the first great national environmental battle. Uh, the Sierra Club uh, came together, which Muir was funding out of his pocket, pretty much. And they, uh, and they had garden clubs, women's clubs, uh, uh, professors uh, all over the country sending in letters. 5,000 letters were landing on each congressman's desk uh, saying, don't take this, don't do this, don't give the water rights to San Francisco, you need to preserve this park. Um, they, they lost that battle uh, because San Francisco put a lot of capital into it and also um, had that, that sort of goodwill after um, having such a uh, tough time with the, 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 the Great Fire. But at the same time, uh, Muir and the Sierra Club created this grassroots environmental movement uh, where people were not just defending nature in their backyard, they were <coughs> defending nature all over the country. And you know, for for posterity, and um, and so and then uh, that was in 1914. In 1916, the National Park Service Act was passed, which made all national parks inviolable. So really, Muir and Johnson lost the battle for Hetch Hetchy, but they won the war. And I just want to conclude. Here's here's Hetch Hetchy. This is the battle. This is the, the valley that's very like Yosemite. And even before this this battle happened, Muir was extolling the beauty of Hetch Hetchy, saying in some ways it had some features that were even more magnificent than uh, Yosemite itself. This is now under 200 feet of uh, water. There's a restored Hetch Hetchy movement uh, to this day. Uh, but um, during that time, um, uh, President Roosevelt uh, did a whistle stop tour in 1903, and he went out to California. Uh, Johnson said, uh, President Roosevelt, if you go out there, you need to go to Yosemite Valley and you need to find this guy, John Muir, and, and talk to him. And uh, so I'm just going to close with uh, a little passage uh, from that part here. Uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is Roosevelt. I shall never forget our three camps, 
he would write Muir, the first in the solemn temple of the giant sequoias, the next in the snowstorm among the silver firs near the brink of the cliff, and the third on the floor of, of the Yosemite, in the open valley fronting the stupendous rocky mass of El Capitan, with the falls thundering in the distance on either hand. Back on his whistle-stop tour, Roosevelt made use of freshly inspired elocution in the vein of his new friend Muir, telling Sacramentans, Lying out at night under the giant sequoias has been like lying in a temple built by no hand of man, a temple grander than any human architect could by any possibility build. And I hope for the preservation of the groves of giant trees simply because it would be a shame to our civilization to let them disappear. They are monuments in themselves. I ask that your marvelous natural resources be handed on unimpaired to your posterity. We are not building this country of ours for a day. It is to last through the ages. The president's deeds would be even more impressive. He would sign into existence five national parks, 18 national monuments, 55 national bird sanctuaries and wildlife refuges, and 150 national forests. Camping with the president was a remarkable experience, Muir later said. I fairly fell in love with him. And I think it's fair to say Roosevelt fell in love with Muir too. And um, that's really the, the nascence of our environmental movement. And, uh, you know, Roosevelt was our greatest uh, uh, environmental political leader. Uh, and uh, it's just one final image here. Um, Muir was not naive. He knew that uh, he knew that this, uh, even though he had these achievements in creating the national park, the national forest, um, that this was going to be a constant tension and battle. Uh, that that there were various ways to use these resources, and not many people understood the spiritual um, value of it. And that was a bit of an uphill battle. So he knew that we had to fight that for, for that that battle forever. This is a view from. Uh, last October, I was there with my wife. She took this picture. I include this just to show you. Yeah, this is the Valley Four in October. You can still go there, have moments of, of beauty and tranquility. That's the sunset on Half Dome right there. Uh, happy to take questions. Would love to sign your books. Again, thanks to Robert Owen for inviting me and for uh, making the generously making the books available. Yes. I'm amazed by that breadth of your writing, the different subjects, the Hatfields and McCoys. Oh, how do you just come up with different things you, that you're interested in? Yeah, I, I've, I've just um, been fortunate to be able to move from one thing that inspired me to another. One thing's kind of led to another. Um, starting with the maritime research I did for, for Patrick O'Brien. And um, this, this was a bit of an outlier. I have West Virginia roots, and so that, that was uh, recommended to me to, to write the Hatfield McCoy uh, book, and I went there and did some research and realized that part of that story was still on the table. But this one just purely happened from really being stunned by, by that view of, um, from inspiration point. It, it really kind of knocked me off my feet. I couldn't believe. Uh, instantly, I was like, America changed for me in that moment. I knew I, I wanted to do something with that. But, um, but it's been fun. Muir was also, uh, whenever Johnson tried to get him to write something, Muir couldn't write it. But when he was inspired by it, he, he could get the job done. He was a bit of a reluctant writer, but I've been fortunate to be able to write about stuff that really I'm passionate about. Yes. What's your process? Uh, how do you go about it? you outline? How, how do you do this? Yeah. You know, I, um, I, I research and write at the same time which is a little unusual, and I layer. I don't, I don't do all my research and then make a lot of cards and go write it. I, I will go through sources and pull out what I think's best. And because we have computers, you can lay out your book, and you know, I have all my chapters, so you, you also never get um, writer's block that way, because whatever you're doing that's inspiring you, I can go to chapter 11 and just lay down the information in there. So um, that, that's kind of how I do it. And I just go through sources and sources, and then I go. Um, one thing I always tell, tell um, new writers is um, all my, I, I do all my initial research first, all my book research, all that hard stuff in the tree that's getting ready to, to go on site. When I wrote about skeletons on the Sahara, where they, these guys were enslaved on the desert, when it comes to Sahara, it's like, you only get one crack at that, right? And I had National Geographic going with me, so I didn't want to look like a dummy. So I had a whole manuscript with me, with the, and I knew the holes I had in the manuscript, and so the questions to ask and what to look for. So 
Um, that's kind of my process. And, and then the, 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 the publisher generally has to drag the book away from me because I'm still adding at the very end, you know, copy it. I'm like, can I put one more fact in there or, you know, or switch, change this? It's, it's not the prettiest process, but it, it kind of works for me. It's a fact that uh, yeah, for me, I guess. Yes. Do you ever use generative AI? Is that <laughs> I don't even know what that is. Yeah, no. um, I, I did have somebody in a, in a uh, kind of a book club I'm in uh, do a biography of me using that, and it was pretty funny. Some of it was pretty good, and some of it was totally wild. But I imagine that down the road, as it gets perfected, that maybe it's going to have some, some uses. Yes? Where are the... Uh, yeah, obviously you've been out there recently. What are sort of the environmental issues now for that part of the country? Oh my gosh. Um, it's a bit of a catastrophe. And I can recommend a great book. Uh, Mark Arax's The Dreamt Land. Really beautifully written book. And in it, um, he talks about how they re-engineered all of California. All the rivers have been channeled down the south. Three quarters of the populations in the south, three quarters of the waters in the north. And so none of the rivers flow where they're supposed to flow. It's all moved down and, and well, it's, it's, a, it's a big mess. But, and then corp, you know, Wall Street came in and started buying up nut farms and drilling down deeper and lowering the water table. So all the mom, mom and pop farmers have driven, been driven out. But if you just want to talk about the national parks, it's, it's population. You know, it's trying to, you know, um, trying to live up, I think, to Muir's ideal of making the parks available to everybody. Everybody deserves spiritual fulfill fulfillment and the opportunity to be able to go to the parks. But what do you do when 3.5 million people are going to the parks in a year uh, to, to Yosemite National Park alone? You know, how, how, how can you have a, a real experience there? Um, and, I, you know, I've, that's kind of why I say, look, get off the beaten path and you, you can find it right now. And whether they have to limit that, it's a shame if they do have to limit it, but that, that might be the way it is. Um, the, the, one of the biggest uh, sequoias left, the bull tree, uh, you can drive in, it's in Sequoia National Forest, drive in on dirt roads for three miles, hike in a mile. My wife and I did that, sat there, uh, had lunch for an hour, and not another soul came there. So you can still, you know, find those things, but, but it's, it's, there's some tough issues we face. And then, of course, all the wildfires and the arguing over how best to manage that uh, is another tough issue. Yes? Uh, what would Muir think about our conservation efforts today, and did he contribute to any international uh, conservation efforts? Um, uh, what would Muir think about our, our efforts today? I think, you know, I don't think he could have uh, comprehended completely the population thing, but the reason why he wanted to save Hetch Hetchy was he said, hey, here's a mirror image of Yosemite. It's already overcrowded with 500 people there. You know, so um, we need the other one so people can go there. So uh, I don't know that he could have comprehended 3.5 million people, but but he knew that we needed to preserve these places so that people could get out there and, and enjoy it in tranquility. I mean, he would go out, he'll go out and get caught in the mountains in a snowstorm, and you're worried about whether he's going to survive. He's building a hut, and a bird will fly in, and he's feeding it breadcrumbs, and then looking at the snow crystals on his hands, and looking at the tracks in the morning from the bears. You know, he just had to do this amazing mentality. Um, internationally, I mean, these were some early concepts. They were already in Europe. They were already forest farming. At Gifford Pinchot, we go over there and train and become our first forest forester. Uh, first chief forester, and he was in that commission that created that, that saved uh, those trees. And Muir and he were friends, and they've been called rivals because they kind of represent two different parts of environmentalism, preservation, and, um, and, and what's the other one? Just, uh, I've lost my word. Anyway, <laughs> um, farming it basically for use and preserving it as it was supposed to be. But I think Muir's somewhat misunderstood there because you know he wanted people to come to nature and he wanted to bring people to and now we we sometimes want to say oh he was a purist he didn't he was trying to keep people out never never yes there's a great story called the hedge hedge between muir and different pinchel and their conflicts over hedge hedge yeah um turns out apparently muir had some I think that's why Roosevelt liked him so much. He would stand up in any And Roosevelt had some colorful language as well. But um, yeah, he and Pinchot had a very interesting relationship. 
And, and Pinchot was kind of um, uh, Roosevelt's right-hand man on the environment. And so Roosevelt could play it both ways. He could be the big environmental savior, but he could also have Pinchot hard hitting below. And so I think that's what brought Muir and Pinchot, even though they were friends and had camped together um, into some conflict. And you know, the thing I like to do with history is I try to go back, get into the original sources. When I quote from Muir, I'm quoting from his journals, not from his school articles as much as possible, because that's close to his thinking. I'm trying to bring them alive. But as history gets further away from the events, it kind of gets crystallized into like people who represent things. And I think they get misunderstood. Um, I don't think they're quite, uh, you know, um, counter e to each other as, as um, they're sometimes portrayed to be. Yes? I got to ask this way for athletics. So, what's outside of your championship, what's your favorite Willie Scroggs or UNC lacrosse story? Because I'm a protege of Willie, I had to work for him for. Eight or nine years. So. Yeah. Well, most of my good Willie Scrog stories, I can't <laughs> But his, his son is a member of the yeah. yeah. he, he was he he was an amazing coach. And I was probably um, if he had a thousand players in his career, I was probably the thousand. So I, but but you know what? Um, but I, I got a letter and I got a ring because I've worked hard in practice. You know, and that's the kind of coach he was. If you came and worked hard in practice, um, he took care of you. And he recognized that as being as important as the, the great, a little bit like Muir in nature. He, he liked the biggest mountain and the littlest weed. Well, that's what he's really scrogs. And, 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 and his team, his players, they live and die for him. You know, he was that kind of coach. You, you, you know if you, you worked with him. And, but, I, you know, I was there with uh, Tommy Sears and Peter Vogel. And that, I mean, that was just an, an amazing group of guys. Um, Really driven, super talented, and um, it, it was it was fun to be there and, and just be around them. But I, I smartly moved on to being the editor of a literary magazine. <laughs> I, I took a look at my grade point average, and it wasn't very good. And it didn't promise to get better unless I, you know, uh, did something about it. So after two years, I, I did move on. But it was fun. Well, thank you so much for. for having